Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are on with da -da -da -da, Dr. Tom Tolley for another great episode of Ask the Vet. Um, and you're our vet, so we get to ask you questions if we have any. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Literally, uh, it's uh, the most literal webinar we host, Ask the Vet. <laughs> I don't know. When's the solar eclipse? I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah. I, when is, is it coming up? It's in April. Oh, yes, it is. It is. Uh, and hopefully everybody... Uh, gets a chance it doesn't happen uh, often in your backyard it's the first time it's happened in my life in the backyard but i mean i have to travel uh, a little bit but uh it's close enough okay so so do you have special ocean. glasses <laughs> do you have safety glasses to watch it in uh oh, yeah. i don't believe that <laughs> is this okay, any yeah. way affect our birds if we bring our birds out and watch <laughs> no, the solar I, eclipse do we need well, obviously we need to be yeah, I will wear safety glasses. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, hopefully it's even. You know, you know, it, it could be cloudy, and then yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so is there any any danger to your if you bring your your companion feather companion out to watch solar eclipse and you've got it, like them looking at the sun? Is there do you not do you not want your bird to look at the sun when it's the eclipse? No, you you know I it would it would affect them in the same way it would you um you know i would uh, i think historically that birds probably are are smart enough not to look at it unlike uh, some of or, us you like, know, they I, would like, well, I don't think so so um but you you definitely don't want to uh, put your bird's eye but it's going right through the middle from the northeast to texas you know so you know there's gonna be a lot of people you know, you say that. but anyway so yeah. and it's spring so it's good and and uh the chickens are laying eggs right now so uh we're we wow. uh, have some chicken not you know, we have booster berries now the fever has agents, so, so. The, the fever has the 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 um the booster berries for chickens their new diet yes 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 there you go i mean that was a great segue i, I mean you didn't even tell me to say that <laughs> no <not laughs> and the, the pack it's so cute they're like little booster berry chickens. i know yeah. i don't know you, you have a pack there i, I don't have anything no there. i don't have any chickens so i don't yeah. really have a booster berry <laughs> pack but yeah um, but yeah all right yeah, why 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 should the chickens be denied some healthy uh, diet, right? <laughs> no, they should not. They should not. And I'm telling They're you, getting leftovers or, or corn kernels. <laughs> and I think they probably enjoy those uh, nutrient berries uh, as much as any of the birds. So yes, yes. All cool. right. So so uh, let's see. Let, let's let's lay down the the the, the rules for our our ask the vet. We uh, if you have a question for Doctor Tully, use the Q and A feature and not the chat feature. And um, I'm hoping we get a, a stump the vet question today, one that you you don't know the answer to, and that you have to look up for the next time. Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, maybe so. All right, I'm gonna pull out all my answers right here, so I'll have. There them. we go. They're all pre. You can't <laughs> stump me with all these answers right here. <laughs> all right, all right. You ready for the first one? Uh yes, ma'am. All right. This is from Frank. Uh, at what age will my ten month old? Um, Magna double yellowhead become hormonal and what is appropriate number of times to feed cooked sweet potato weekly? How often can you feed sweet potato and uh, become hormonal? Well, uh, you know, uh, it's a, is it a two year? Did he say two year old? 10 month old. We're talking 10, 10 month, month old. old. Gosh, it's yeah. 10 months old. Amazon. When will it, when will it get hormonal? Um, <clears throat> Well, and it's a male, I would suspect, um, because the males uh, seem to be a little bit more um, problematic in the Amazon. Though, over, you know, and I mean, the females could be too. I'm just looking at experience of people getting bit on the face and their lovely little bird, or, or uh, you know. Uh, just uh, you know getting attacked when the kind of a dr jekyll mr hyde type thing um and so what you're looking at is individual but uh and i've seen it more in males i don't know you laura i mean as far as female uh they get hormonal because they lay but it just seems like the aggressiveness that um uh, i've experienced come mostly from the males and so there you go. Is it a female? Is it a male? Um, and so if, you know, when it 
does is um, when they get to sexual maturity, uh, in my experience, could happen a little bit before, a little bit uh, after. There's not a specific uh, time frame for from behavior issues as it relates to hormones. Just think humans. Some people have uh, some some difficulty before. Some people have difficulty a little later in life. And so it's the same way with birds. Um, but when they uh, become mature, uh, sexually mature, then that, that, that would have, uh, occur. Sometimes you can look at some of these parrots at three, uh, maybe even before, a little bit before three, four years. Um, and uh, you know, somebody said, well, you know, can, can say a, a two-year-old parrot laying eggs being sexually mature. Yeah. Uh, that's that's true, um, but you're looking at seasonality and 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 this because most of the time, and and again, my experience with Amazon uh, parrots, uh, uh, um, the genus um, that is going to be <clears throat> uh, usually spring, like right now, April, May, uh, when it occurs. So, you know, when you look at the, the, the time frame when that occurs and the age, that'll kind of give you an idea there. So, um, two, three, four years is when it may occur, but then you have the individual aspect of it. How much uh, is affected? Uh, how much is this particular bird? There's been, there's been Amazons that just don't seem to have this behavior. Um, it is, it is, it, it does occur and, um, uh, and it's possible, but the, there's varying degrees of this. And of course it can, it can develop over time. Um, uh, but it's just an unknown. So that's, that's just kind of, uh, the basics when it can occur, when it does occur in my experience, uh, as far as the age. And there's variability uh, in that between male, female, and uh, also onset and degree of aggressiveness uh, on that. Now, the other question was about sweet potatoes, yams. How often can you feed them? Can you feed them? Well, I mean, I don't uh, <clears throat> know. Uh, again, that's just kind of a single diet item. Uh, and you could, you could uh, I think, theoretically feed them every day, but <clears throat> again, it's kind of a starchy uh, diet, and, uh, and you have an Amazon parrot. I uh, was lecturing to the students today <clears throat> about nutrition, and one of the, uh, and talking about the proper nutrition to, to feed the animal, you know, for feed the birds, and then I had the question, do we have overconditioned birds? And overconditioned birds are birds that are overweight. Mm. Uh, and I did, and I said, well, we do. Uh, we do have it. And, it and, and, and often it's genus or species related as far as parrots are concerned, that Amazon parrots are one of the birds that we, we see this, uh, that can, or, or, or kind of, susceptible to it. Uh, some cockatoo species are, um, <clears throat> and, and you know, you're looking at galahs or rose-breasted cockatoos are somewhat uh, susceptible to this. And then also other birds in which they get just a little bit too many treats. So <clears throat> what I, I, I would say, and, and, and one of the things that, uh, it, you know, it's kind of dependent on the aviary, but I can remember visiting the aviary down in uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, where they had the uh, Puerto Rican Amazon project, and they had a, a very diversified diet, and and, I, and they had uh, all these papayas and the mangoes, and they had the fresh fruit, and and then they had vegetables, and 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 I, they the fresh um, uh, fruit I, they didn't feed the same diet every day, and so. To me, if you were able to, uh, and if the bird liked um, the, the the sweet potatoes, I would say that I wouldn't 
there, there wouldn't be any need to to uh, feed that uh, over uh, three to four times a week uh, at the most. Um, you could feed it every day, but uh, again, that's a, a high a high. Uh, it has a lot of benefit, but what you're what you're looking at is uh, uh, kind of spreading out that benefit, uh, and then uh, not just kind of. Uh, having the bird only eat that uh, for the majority of the diet because that's going to fill up that bird a uh, pretty good bit. And it's just like macadamia nuts and, and hyacinths, right? You know, you feed them everything out there and then you have a macadamia nuts and the next thing you know, it's only eating macadamia nuts. And then, and then you're looking at uh, possible vitamin deficiency. Here, I'm not sure how much, but you know, we still only have one item, but I'd say three to four times a week, but those are some thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then Linda is curious, uh, why do birds stand on their, uh, why do birds stand with their feathers up, shake them and then put the feathers back down? Uh, they see their eclectus do it, wild birds um, on a cassowary at the zoo yesterday. So why are they kind of, um uh, again it's um uh it, it, behaviorally uh i you know this is this is one where i can't say i can only speculate why they they may do that uh as a behavior issue um one um is that their their bodies and in, in uh <clears throat> just has uh, all of these feathers and that uh, shaking those feathers um, is 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 one way to kind of kind of get them into their position, so to speak, and uh, and and so you'll uh, you know it, and so that's that's what I would say to raise their feathers, shake them, and then when they put them down, they kind of fall back into place. Uh, so that would be. That would be it over and above anything that it's like something is bothering it, you mm -hmm. know, something's underneath those feathers and, 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 you know, it itches or, you know, that it, it, it it's irritating or whatever. And it, it, it does it. I'm not, I'm not convinced that that happens all the time, but there may be a number of reasons why they, they do that. Mm -hmm. But I think that if they're just doing it, that it would be more of a a means because they're just so fastidious in their in their grooming and their preening. You know, I mean preening. You know, it's, it's like that's a bird term. Yeah. You know, kind of like uh, <clears throat> pecking order. <laughs> that's something birds. You know, something's contributed to our vocabulary to to look look nice right i'm preening you know so so that's that's what i would think it would be more um for that but it is also a behavior that if something's bothering it or kind of you know that that's what they would do kind of yeah. reminds me of my when my dog gets up after a nap and he kind of just shakes his fur yeah maybe. you know you you see that when they're wet right they 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 shake it but the get get kind of dry off but but they'll just also do that on their own you know uh when you said like you said uh, kind of a nap or something but that's what happens you know with the bodies covered they can they do that but that's a, a very interesting question yeah yeah good observation too and yeah i, I want to know what the cassowary aren't those the deadly birds with the spikes like the poison on there yeah oh yes 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 uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Bonnie. Um, they have a, I think, 18 year old. It says 18 year old uh, male cockatiel uh, that's dealing with hormonal uh, with hormone issues. Um, so they're modifying the environment, the food, and everything. Uh, how do they figure out how much food to provide him? He eats pellets, mash, sprouts, and microgreens. Um, microgreens. Um, mm. Also, if able, what are the cons of Lupron besides possibly having to repeat? They're talking a male cockatiel. But a male cockatiel. Yeah. Do they normally for lupron for male co cockatiels? Well, <clears throat> for aggressive behavior uh, or for behavioral issues, it has been um, been used. 
Um, and uh, again, for, for kind of reducing kind of a hormonal influence uh, on that, that would be interesting. I haven't heard, you know, kind of putting one of the first questions with the one of this, this question, you know, when an Amazon parrot, what if we put use the use Lupron and then <clears throat> and, and uh, put that into the uh, Amazon parrot during the time that the hormonal uh, influence causes aggression? Uh, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, we've used the Lupron uh, implants for a number of uh, things. The the one one I one thing I can say, <clears throat> Laura, is that very little of it other than with a female reproductive activity is science has any scientific basis it's just like well this does this so possibly we'll have a treatment response if for that uh cloacal prolapse for instance that's what we've used it for because we we feel that it's uh hormonal i know that <clears throat> we had one cockatoo i know i'm kind of going off on a path here but it's still with the Lupron because people hear about that. They hear about the Lupron implant and we can do it for this, we can do it for that and, and see if it works. And they're not cheap either, um, but um, it's a nice tool to have, but <clears throat> you have to know what you're, you're getting. And for the most part, it's either observational by the veterinarian Oh, well, I know there's no scientific evidence that this works, but I can tell you, I've put it in all of these birds that had this problem and we had a resolution, you know, and even with um, the ovulation, it's like, well, how long is it going to last, you know, with a bird that's laying eggs? Well, it could last a week, <clears throat> the last six months, it may last a year, uh, I haven't had really any last quite that long in a bird, but it could last six months to a year. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're looking at. I can't, I, you know, there's no guarantees uh, other than it's not going to last forever. Uh, and that is sometimes helpful, but if the bird starts looking like it's going into uh, reproductive activity, then, uh, you know, nest building and getting paper, you know how that goes, yeah. then it's, uh, or acting like focalizing, then it's time to get a new implant. And like I said, <clears throat> for the cloacal prolapse, uh, there's different reasons that that happens, but with cockatoos in particular, it appears that hormones is uh, uh, really uh, a major factor in that occurring and i know that we've had birds that we've had uh, the good dr avery bennett fantastic surgeon remove the ovary in the bird and uh you know and has removed ovaries and this has stopped the colloquial prolapse when nothing else would so mm -hmm. that's the hormonal effect and why we use that in but it it we did use it in this cockatiel and it, it worked for a month or two and that was it. So <clears throat> you have to be, uh, uh, you know, you know, careful about that. And this is a male. So you're looking at behavior. So the thought is that maybe it'll work. Um, no evidence uh, other than just anecdotal or observational and give it a try because it can be frustrating and it's interesting that it's an 18 year old bird but did this just start occurring you know did it just start occurring and like all of a sudden it's like oh wow, it's aggressive and it's like i don't know where this is coming from and yeah. it's a, and it's a male and the one thing be eight though it has e dot t dot so is that eight or eight what's that abbreviation for well, an 18-year-old cockatiel is pretty old. So an eight-year-old cockatiel is... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. It was three years old. They just clarified. Sorry. Yeah. Three years? Yeah. Well, we've gone from 18 to three. <laughs> we've gone way down at eight. I'm sorry. That's only... I apologize. Never mind. No. Probably... no, everything I said was important, but uh, just... I mean, it was it was useful. Yeah. But it was three years old. Uh, so anyway, so they're just... Uh, so it's just kind of gets getting 
getting started. I don't know. Um, and so the question is really, I know that they had the Lupron implant and what else, anything else to, to do for it? Uh, no, no. They're just uh, wondering but about the food, about how much, uh, how much food to provide them. How much food? Yeah, like, do you <clears throat> change the amount of food that she... Well, well I mean, you know, it, as far as the food, I I usually, <clears throat> I know that there's some recommendations on on giving a certain amount of food, <clears throat> and then I would base it on the, the bird itself. It's a great question on that. The, the, uh, uh, the amount of food is, uh, again... I usually have, for me, I can tell you, I have uh, uh, a bowl of pellets and I have uh, seed and uh, have uh, used, uh, I have some Nutriberries or Avocates, either one. And, uh, and dependent upon what the uh, situation is, is I have some, uh, some uh, vegetables or, or fruit, but, but very little on that. And, and usually just keeping the food in the, uh, in the cage, the bird's not going to uh, eat all the pellets in, in one day. Um, uh, some, some can if they only prescribe certain amount. Uh, mm -hmm. Some companies do that. But uh, uh, I've never had any, any difficult, uh, difficulty uh, keeping the, the birds. And then they have the fresh the fresh chop and the and the different uh, uh, greens and and different things like that that uh, the people use and gives us supplements um, and the seed as again if I have seed in there uh, then then I uh, leave the seed in until the bird uh, actually uh, if there's multiple seeds now sometimes if little budgies or what have you may have more millet in there that needs to be changed out and you're not going to have them eat different things but the larger birds you have different seeds and i leave it in so that they can get it so um there's really no certain amount for most food it's okay. just to have it fresh have it available to them and make sure that you try to get them to have as much <clears throat> you don't want to be throwing it out and so you want them to make sure that they eat as much as they can so you get a, a better return on that investment so so that's that's my recommendation for those foods that recommend a certain amount every day only feed that uh, and and if you feed more than that diet then you may not eat it all uh, because they're eating other things like you know, if somebody feeds sweet potatoes or chop or what have you then they're going to uh, that'll take up some of their their uh, their appetite so uh, there's nothing specific on that but you just want it fresh you want to make sure that uh, you have it available to them and uh, feed is uh, directed if that's the case with uh uh, on the package. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have a question from Kathy about um, her green cheek conure. They want to know is to stick their cancer common in green cheek conures. Her, the male has a, had a tummy for years. Blood work never indicated an issue, but there is a mass. He is on an organic variety diet, like top spellets, a mix of grain seeds and homegrown sprouts and tiny pieces of nuts for rewards. So um, is that common in green cheeks or mm, parrots in general? Are green cheeks more common? <clears throat> well, no, uh, I, I, I don't think that um, if it was, if, if, if you said uh, budgie, I would say that has been, that has been described more in budgies. And when I say described, I'm not necessarily mean published, but it is known in publications. And, um, but just people who see little budgies uh, mm -hmm. that, that you would have a gonadal tumor, whether it's ovarian or whether it's uh, testicular. 
uh, as green cheek conures go, we've seen a, a number of green cheek conures, but mm, I don't, uh, I don't think that that's any more common than any anything else uh, that we'll we've seen in in green cheek conures. Uh, so, uh, no, that's. <clears throat> that's not uh, uh, unusual. And if it is in fact a, a testicular tumor, sometimes those are those are difficult to identify. Although a green cheek conure, you're looking at 60 to 70 grams, eh, sometimes below a little 60 grams, but <clears throat> you would, uh, the, the way that you would probably get a definitive on that uh, is a, an endoscopic biopsy hmm. but you know with an endoscope going in getting a biopsy and then uh id in it uh, that way uh, so you can that you can get that i was trying to <laughs> there was something at the end of that uh oh, um well they they um they were saying oh, they feed yeah um uh, variety diet pellets uh, mixed with grain seeds they make homegrown sprouts and tiny pieces of nuts for reward yeah 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 the, the little pieces of nuts I, I i was at the uh the houston parrot festival um uh and it was uh very very good they have it every year and in, in january and i'll uh end of january and i want yeah, anybody to you know who may uh be of interest it was it was excellent um uh they they at the, the parrot fest, but they had little um little uh nut slivers. And so we're talking about <clears throat> sometimes birds are uh just like any patient uh people are don't want to take their medicine, right? Mm -hmm. And so so it's good if you can develop and find a treat for your little bird, okay? And uh, just in case you have to give it medicine and uh, you don't wanna get it out of the cage or what have you, um, but you could train the bird and uh, and it's problematic if they don't like little pieces. I think these were little almond slivers that were bird treats or something like that. And, and get the bird to like them. Or, or it may like them from the get-go, like, hey, I can't get enough of that. My derby and parrot would have just loved almond slivers. But, you know, save them and train them uh, to that if he, you know, if the bird is getting the medication, that um, if the bird takes the medication, they get a almond sliver. And that will help you. Uh, with treating the bird, if you ever have to treat the bird, you know exactly what you can give it that it likes. Now, if you, you know, get to the point where the, you know, you overdo it and you try to give the bird that to entice it to do something, well, then the bird is training you. <laughs> He's training you to give it treats to try to do something well if you give me another one i may do uh maybe two more <laughs> so you only give the treat after the bird uh does what you want it to do and so that's the you know having these things you know people like what do i use it doesn't like anything well these were made specifically as like little training treats, you know, little almond slivers. I mean, you don't know, uh, but I, I saw those and I thought that was just a fantastic idea. Uh, yes. on, so I wanted to, to to bring that up when she mentioned that, because that is something about training the bird that really helps because if the bird doesn't get treated, it doesn't get any better. Hmm. Good point. Okay. Uh, Linda asks, a uh, 35-year-old Congo African Grey has a... Um, Xanathoma, is that correct? Xanathoma. On the left wing, uh, it seems to be growing. Uh, there are small malformed feathers growing, and it looks like some of the larger feathers have died or not thriving. Uh, what can they do? Bet has not given any information, and um, she's also favoring standing on her opposite leg more. So, 
Anyhow. Well, let's just um, again, a xanthoma is a uh, is a type of tumor. It's 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 a little bit uh, a little bit more complex than a lipoma, which is a fatty tumor. Um, but it's uh, usually kind of a uh, yellow to orange uh, coloration, light or darker. But the 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 xanthoma um, usually are are somewhat in 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 my experience. I mean, they can they could get <clears throat> there's different rare cases of that, uh, <clears throat> but but usually they're localized <clears throat> they're they're uh, uh they don't they don't metastasize uh and they're usually localized they can become locally large just like a, a lipoma a fatty tumor can become very large and pendulous and um and so <clears throat> i don't think that there's um it's likely that there's any um connection between the bird standing on its leg more than the xanthoma on the wing if it's truly a xanthoma which i i would believe your veterinarian has taken a biopsy or has has uh, determined that's what it is based on the uh based on what you're you're saying his you know through history um because uh you, you want to make a confirmation that's the best way you're looking at treating and usually something like with xanthomas or or lipomas um that uh, that you know depending on where it is there's not a lot of tissue there <clears throat> but depending on where where it is and what uh and and, and the tissue surrounding tissue and the skin well you can you can remove that <clears throat> and then <clears throat> then that that should do it uh, uh, with the xanthoma. <clears throat> now, if it's, if it's in an area that's more distal, there's not a lot of skin, then there has to be, uh, you can just, again, with the confirmation that it's a xanthoma, you can, you can monitor it, um, and, uh, and see if it, it grows large, larger as it gets larger, you get a tissue expansion <clears throat> so then you can you can get under it and you do have tissue to close on that but that's xanthoma yeah okay yeah. Xanthoma. all right um <laughs> and then question from lynette uh so they have four female parrots um a congo african gray an amazon and a collectus and a bare-eyed cockatoo uh, the collectus and older uh, Congo are 40 plus. Um, first year, all are hormonal, but only two are laying eggs. They have two questions for you. Do they trigger each other to lay eggs? And at 40 plus, will the Congo African Grey slow down in her egg laying? Um, she came to them as a chronic layer, but they've knocked that down a bit. So those are really good questions. Can they, can those, all three of those, all four of those females, can they kind of make it? Become more inclined to lay eggs, being around each other. Well, that's a good question, and I say that quite often because we have such good yes. attendees to these webinars, and I thank you for those good questions. And sometimes you have questions that are there's, as I mentioned, there's just no scientific basis on that, in that there's variation and. Uh, and then all you do is, uh, all I can do is give you my my thoughts based on <clears throat> on uh, my observation over the years, and and also uh, what I've seen and heard from others. Uh, and then we're looking at this. We have uh, some some uh, older birds here, <clears throat> and they're still laying eggs. And the the question is, is you have four female birds here <clears throat> and um, I don't know how that dynamic came to be, meaning I don't know 
well, we had one for so many years, they didn't do anything. And then we got another bird. Then we got these other two birds. And then the next thing, so the last three or four years, we've had these birds together. And then, <clears throat> then all of a sudden, none of the birds were laying eggs and they're all laying eggs now. Okay. You know, was it because one started laying? Well, I can tell you, <clears throat> in my experience that um unless it's a, a a pair that have been laying and 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 this doesn't always occur um what i've observed over the years is that it's very difficult just to have a solo pair of birds like lay quickly and successfully just one pair of birds we have one pair of birds I'm ready for some babies. Hmm. I'm ready for some babies. They, especially if they haven't ever, you know, you just set up this pair. They never, they hadn't had any production. And, uh, and, and so I've just, can it happen? Yes, it can happen just like a solar eclipse. I mean, you can have it happen and, and then uh, one pair, and it's like, I just bought this pair of birds. I set them up in my garage, and I don't know anything about birds. And the next thing you know, I have a pair of, uh, I just like slender bill cockatoos. And now I have, a, a, you know, a, a clutch of slender bill cockatoos. I don't know anything about it. You know, that can happen. That has happened. Um, uh, and, and so... <clears throat> So when you're, when you're, when you're looking at this, um, but what I've found is, and what I've seen is that the more birds monkey see monkey do. And so there's a, there's somewhat of a, a connection. If you have multiple birds or you have birds that are laying that I've seen people have more success with the birds that see other birds and then they like oh what are they doing over there you know and i mean things are happening you know i don't know vocalization or they have their own little little uh uh telepathy that they're using but um uh, that if you know that is a distinct possibility that there would be some peer pressure or peer influence i would say yes. in those birds laying that's that's just uh what i would say is a, is a, a distinct possibility um and uh, so yeah so being 40 over 40 the the, the they slow down a little they get their egg laying then uh <clears throat> you know i uh you would you know, it's kind of interesting. Birds uh, that are older, <clears throat> uh, the um, the ability to to lay, um, you know, seems to maintain itself well into to older older age for birds. I don't, I don't I don't know. It would be something to kind of look into as far as uh, the reproductive activity and how they can kind of maintain this because you're talking about an African gray, right? At 40 mm -hmm. playing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an old, old gray to me. Uh, uh, and, and so that that's, uh, but what that's saying is that that's saying that the bird is physiologically um, active and uh functioning reproductively and that the owner is providing excellent care excellent nutrition to make sure that all of those components are hitting on all cylinders and that bird is functioning hormonally and it is actively laying at 40. so that is a kudos to the owner um and the bird is uh, again <clears throat> within an environment, it feels comfortable enough to lay mm, yeah. for this to happen. Because if they're stressed and they're not comfortable within the environment, uh, then that's going, and they're concerned for their, you know, life, 
then they're going to, that's going to really affect the stress wise, uh, they're laying, you know, I mean, so yeah, so very good. All right. We have a question about um, if, if it's okay to give parrots chicken and or fish bones that are cooked in broth until they're soft and also are microgreens green, micro green safe for conures and parakeets? So foodie question for you. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, soft, um, it's, it's hard uh, um, to say that. Uh, the only thing I would say is that I know that birds, I mean, for as long as I've been in practice, and that's been six months, that um, that the situation is that as far as the birds are concerned and people giving them bones and seeing pictures of that or what have you, um, I, uh, I know that birds like them. I don't know if you can get them soft enough <clears throat> but I guess you can. I guess you can 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 work and get them soft enough. But there is a lot of pliability to those bones, uh, even when they're soft. But uh, always, uh, uh, you would always be careful because if they swallowed a shard, a uh, piece of that bone, a fragment. Uh, that that would be uh, the potential uh, of a problem, uh, but uh, it, it's it, if it was hard, you can imagine it's like swallowing a piece of glass. Uh, not that it would cut necessarily, but it would lodge in there. So you want to be careful. You know, most of the time the birds uh, don't don't swallow that uh what have you they don't swallow them they'll break it apart it's more of a um kind of a foraging uh type of situation with that but i always like you know caution um and and it's just like you know people have fed peanut butter to birds for for years but you know i've i've also saved a little cockatiel uh with the help of many you know we i mean we we were kind of a team recognized had a little peanut butter cracker and it got peanut butter in its throat and was couldn't breathe mm -hmm. so so it's not to say don't feed it peanut butter but you know you have to be um again cognizant of the uh the the risk involved and do everything you can to mitigate those risks. And then, you know, there's an argument that all of the webinar attendees can say, well, you know, there's a risk with everything. Well, there may be, but at the same time, there's, uh, there's greater risk than others. Um, and, and, and just, uh, keep that and, you know, keep that in mind and do what you can. And, uh, so uh, I know that they, they enjoy that, uh, the bones, and, and I've seen that and whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, just uh, caution. And, but the, if the birds like it and they don't, they don't swallow, then there's, I bet you they enjoy it. So there you go. What, right. uh, there was another part of that question. But, um. Oh, are microgreens safe for conures and parakeets? So, well, is that like chop or microgreens or whatever? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would, I would, <clears throat> I, I um, think that they're as safe as they would be for others. I'm going to look at microgreens. I mean, that's a stump the bed. I mean, microgreens. I don't know, uh, you know, if that's a uh, a kind of a, you know, a, kind of a seed. Uh, oh, yeah. Almost. Did we stump the vet? Did we have? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll look up microgreens, but I, you know, the, sometimes the sprouts, um, you know, people have had sprouts and then they say, well, sprouts, there's this uh, chance of bacterial. Um, that's where we get back into the risk factor again. 
um, how how problematic is the risk, and uh, because I'm I'm sure that uh, I'm going to look at microgreens and it's going to be uh, uh, something like. Uh, uh, chop where you have the, the different uh, okay so brenda say it's a new trendy green like a hydro pot uh oh sorry it's a it's a new trendy you know it kind of reminds me also that, i don't know if this but there is like a, a micro greens kind of like like those those health powders which makes me ask you are those safe to ever like sprinkle on your you know like like the, the little powdered like um it's like a, a green uh, powdery things you can sprinkle in your smoothies and stuff. Can we just take some of that and sprinkle it on our birds' foods and stuff? Mm. I, that's a, a side question, just on the the word microgreens. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, you know <clears throat> absorb all that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's not too much to absorb, but I mean, really. Uh, you have the uh, the microgreens here, and then you have this green stuff that you uh, you put on your smoothies, and yeah. uh, and it's a uh, uh, and it's a vegetable. Oh, I'm just like super greens. I'm sorry. I'm thinking like super greens. It's like a supplemental like powder. You, you see them at the yeah, stores. It's, like super yeah, greens. it's got like, like all it's the powdered like, uh, like uh, vitamins want. and stuff like that. Kind of concentrate. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, for the, for the most part, um, uh, I just, um, uh, the microgreens is that if it's a sprout is like a, um, uh, kind of like a chia pet or something like that. And, um, and, and I know people have used it uh or something like that just like you know sprouts um but it's this is more of a of a green uh a thing and uh probably if it's if it's done correctly there would be no no uh no risk i would just uh, make sure that they're they're washed very well uh before you give it and just not uh, just pick it off and give it to the to the bird because there has been some some bacteria that uh, have been associated with it and and you just want to be more conservative on something like this uh, uh, you want your food washed before you eat it so uh, again I, that's what I would say with the microgreens otherwise I, I don't see any any difficulty if it's uh, one of these uh, kind of uh, grow your own yeah. type thing and then with the uh, like the chia pet. I'm just looking at the chia. Well, one pet. more comment on that is I just got, so apparently it's uh, like the immature greens, like baby greens. Um, so they're more concentrated, like the baby, maybe like, a, you know, like the baby spin, uh, immature greens. So they're not like. Um, I just wash them. I mean, I mean, you hear about, I mean, it's that I, I think that they're safe. Uh, if that's what that is, then it's um, by, um, uh, by all means, you, you, you know, you want to wash that, but that'll be, that would be uh, the fine uh, with that as far as uh, the birds are concerned. But um, as far as the, 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 the health, the, the powder uh, is, that's an interesting question, Laura. Was, because, yeah. Huh? That was my side Side oh, no, I like it. Of... I like it. I mean, I mean, we're, we're, we're hitting, hitting all things. And I think, um that you know it's 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 one of those things where you're looking at exactly what's in it if there's nothing in there that uh can you know where you're looking at concentrating and getting a uh the possibility of uh uh too much of a vitamin or a mineral you know like your a d e and k uh, fat soluble vitamins, but if it's just kind of water soluble B vitamins or vitamin C, you know, and and you and you're having the, the concentration of, with that, then there there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I don't see it. It's just part of a you know supplementation, um, uh, and if the supplements are used, uh, but you just want to. Uh, you know, be careful on, on how much you would use something like that.
Yeah, very good. Okay, we have a question about um, Heidi about cockatiels. So cockatiels feet sometimes get beet red. Is that something to be concerned about? So what about a really red colored, beet red colored cockatiel feet? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, really the, the uh, one thing if you're seeing uh, kind of a uh, red feet, then what that would uh, indicate that there would be uh, a lot of times that birds can't can't uh, dissipate heat well, and uh, this would be dependent on where you see it. So I'm just going to kind of give you some ideas of red feet. You know, people say, well, red feet, what's the deal? Well, birds can't dissipate heat, so if they, they get warm or, uh, or overheated, uh, they will pant, uh, of course, but also their their vessels will dilate. Okay, to try to dissipate the heat, and when that happens, that you can get the the feet can get red. Um, also, if they get uh, hot or what have you, uh, or standing somewhere, that 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 can occur. Uh, theoretically, it's just like if somebody has high blood pressure, or if you see somebody that is like, oh, I'm just a relaxed person. But when you see that relaxed person get upset or angry at somebody, eat, eat their, red. Face, <laughs> their face turns red, right? Beat red. Yeah, beat red. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that is uh, another thing where that is an increase in blood pressure. Okay. And so you have a dilation of your, your, your vessels. So kind of depending on, and then of course, there could be some, some uh, possible nutritional component when the bird would eat something that it would react or have a response to that. Um, also, there's the possibility of hormonal influence when we're looking at uh, you know, having a hormonal influence. If it's about uh, you know uh, reproductively active, uh, that that can occur. So those are all possibilities. I don't know uh, exactly when uh, you know this occurs but you can look at all of those possibilities as far as um what would cause those feet to go you know turn very red and <clears throat> and i say that uh this side and 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 in and, and i know that they uh you know are not dyed or they don't it's not any paint or anything like that. This is this is something that comes and it goes and uh, they turn red and then they get back normal. So and uh, so anything that may influence that blood pressure, hormonal uh, environment, you look at that and see when does it occur and uh, how often and try to connect what is happening before, what's happening after, what happening before, you know, you notice this or what happened before and what happened after. Um, and so it's kind of like behavior training, you know, you kind of look at like, well, what's causing this? Well, what happened? What's just happening before? And then when it gets back to, as it goes back to normal, what's happening, not happening now or happening now. So that's a kind of an investigation. You're going to want to do a little investigation on seeing uh, what uh, may be uh, causing that. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, let's see more. We have time for more questions, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So Michelle wants to know what is the best way to administer assistance if a bird is shaking his head like something is logged like a bird CPR or Heimlich. Uh, they, they would just want to know in case it, an emergency, be prepared for emergency situation. Um, so can yeah. you do a Heimlich maneuver on a bird or a CPR? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> you don't do 
<laughs> talking about the bones earlier, the chicken bones. Yeah, birds don't have diaphragms, though. So, uh, is there an equivalent then to a <laughs> what's that? Is there a birdie equivalent to a Heimlich maneuver or or a CPR? Yeah, <clears throat> the only thing is uh, that you have to uh, grab the bird, you have to open the beak and uh, use a uh, uh, a Q tip or something to uh, call them cotton tipped applicators, but get a Q tip to to get that uh, whatever's in the mouth, like that little cockatiel. Um, you have to get it out. It's like, you know, it's, and, and so you have to open up, you know, get that beak open and then get the, get the, uh, the debris out of there or food or what have you out of there. <clears throat> One of the things that's a great question too, and that uh, people don't, you know, uh, often think about, but we train birds don't have an epiglottis and the birds, meaning they don't have a little flap to close. They just have, they just have two little openings that, that kind of open up, uh, to kind of laryngeal mound. And so they have two, two sides and it opens up and then that's the trachea. And so <clears throat> they can close it but there's no like flap like an epiglottis to cover the hole mm. so it just kind of it, it just kind of closes it opens and closes uh, like like that opens and closes and then mammals have a little flap little epiglottis birds don't and so <clears throat> so what uh what can happen is that that's why if we're tube feeding the bird or we're administering uh, oral medication, uh, we do that at the very, very last thing we do before we put the bird in the cage uh, or the incubator or the, the critical care unit. That's the last thing we do because if the bird starts regurgitating, and this is something then and it's not stressing out and not uh trying to 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 uh uh gasp for air then what what happens is that it can it can control what's coming out and block the 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 material from going in the the uh the trachea aspiration it's called and that's like tube feeding <clears throat> so uh if you have to supplemental feed so that's the last thing you do and if the bird's by itself and it's not be, you know being held and it's trying to struggle to get away it's not going it's less likely to aspirate you never want to give oral medication and kind of oral supplementation and hold the bird you want to set it down so if it does come up that it could control it and shake its head birds will you know they'll kind of regurgitate and shake their head well they're getting that out of there but if you you know i wanted to bring that up but if you wanted to if you had like peanut butter and the bird can't get it out or what have you you have to grab the bird you have to open the beak and you have to get it scoop it out with uh with a q-tip yeah yeah so uh unfortunately there's no heimlich maneuver birds don't have a diaphragm and it's just um you know not uh you know and again you can get pressure you can put pressure but it's not kind of enough yeah okay. very good yeah i didn't know that um uh, cat wants to know uh, they have two uh tim napkin grays um what is the best vitamin they can get for them? One is 10 and the other is, one is about 10 and the other is eight. So uh, do they need vitamins and what would be the best ones that if they do for them? Well, you know, I always, I'm not, uh, you know, I, my personal opinion is that uh, used uh, appropriately um, because we don't know what their recommended daily requirements are. And, uh, is that uh, supplementation 
uh, vitamin supplementation, if used appropriately, isn't a, a bad thing. Um, but uh, as far as the vitamins, I, I, I recommend <clears throat> the one thing that you're looking at is you have vitamins and minerals. And so uh, are you looking at just uh, the vitamin, uh, the vitamin uh, supplementation? Of course, uh, Lefebvre sponsors this uh, uh, webinar and they have uh, an excellent vitamin that's been uh, around uh, uh, since, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and improved upon since uh, uh, Dr. Ted Lefebvre Sr. Uh, was uh, running the company. And uh, like I said, it's been that long and improved upon. Uh, the Necton vitamins, I'm uh, also uh, uh, very, um, I, I, I recommend. And then the, uh, there's a prime vitamins uh, also that uh, uh, have been uh, uh, highly, uh, uh, people have been happy with. So those are, those are kind of the three that, uh, that I uh, uh, would recommend use as directed uh, on the, on the package. And, uh, and, and, and again, uh, with the unknown, as far as the recommended uh, requirements, uh, like I said, for all of these species, specifically the gray too, I don't uh, believe that that's been published. Um, then um, there's, uh, you know, that's not a bad thing, but uh, make sure that you give it uh, appropriately so that they can get the the most benefit from it if you're going to go through that time and trouble. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you have it. That's our last question for the day, uh, for today, for this episode. Um, ah. Now, guess what? We're all going to be on spring break <laughs> or the webinars will be. Um, so I, I just, uh, it was, that's a preview. I'm going to give you an announcement of today's giveaway winner uh, of the garden veggie Nutriberries. Um, Lefebvre's garden Garden Veggie Nutriberries is going to go to Helen Hendrickson. Congratulations, um, Helen. That um, Lefebvre office will reach out to you. Also, another Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. So, so yeah. congrats on that. Um, Very uh, good. Very yeah. good. Okay. And then Brett has reminded me. That, <laughs> so the we April webinars, uh, they'll be posted on, on Facebook today. Um, and I, I believe the first one we have is, is April 12th. That'll be with uh, Dr. Lamb. And she's going to cover passerines, like the smaller birds, like canaries and finches. So um, that'll be an interesting topic. Talk about the little guys. Um, well, there you go. And also, uh, we did a webinar on this. Well, well, was that back in the end of Feb in February about the Phoenix Landing Retreats, the first weekend in April. So check that out. Hopefully, if you can go to it, that'd be awesome. It's the first weekend in April, the special um, uh, webinar we had on that. Um, to give you a, a, a sneak preview of what that is about. And um, yeah, um, so a lot going on. I hope everyone has a great uh, spring, uh, the re rest of March and in the spring. We'll be back April 12th. Um, uh, Dr. Tully, thank you once again for some awesome answers. And uh, those are good takeaways to take into the springtime. And also uh, now we know how to um, help uh you know we won't be doing the Heimlich remover maneuver but we can do other things to help our, our birds if emergency situation arises so yes 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 that's there we right, go. That's right. Is... yes and thank you laura thank you brenda thank you lefebvre and most of all thank the attendees for their wonderful questions and and to uh think about uh making the birds lives that we deal with uh better every yes. day and thank you so much and uh happy that's right and we have to thank you because you're helping us do just that by by generously giving your um your time and your answers to these important questions so that's right, right. fun <laughs> well thank you thank you all right bye -bye. all right guys on that note everyone have a fabulous weekend all the best to you and your flock and until next time bye bye